I am going to start off today's video a little bit differently, but I want you to take a moment. I want you to think about all the wonderful things you have in your life. And this is something I've been doing, trying to do every day is finding the one positive thing I have go, good going for me and the opportunities that I've been given that somebody else may not have. I mean, I look at what is going on in our world right now, the hatred and the disrespect that is going on between the multiple different religions, multiple different races, multiple different people, of different backgrounds, and how lucky we are, um, some of us are, to have the rights and opportunities we have that others don't, and some of the basic essentials we have that others don't. So I want you to take a moment, I want you to think about something you're truly thankful for that maybe you take for granted. I live in a house, I have a nice room, shelter that takes good, that is able to keep me out, out of the elements, out of the rain, out of the snow, out of the storms, out of the cold, out of the hot. I have food in my refrigerator. Um, I have a car I can drive. I'm able to drive. I'm able to go to school and pay for my schooling. I'm able to afford my medications and my diabetic supplies. I have a family that loves, loves me and cares about me. I have amazing friends that literally will do anything for me and I have really good friendships with people who I can talk to at any time if I have a problem and I'm blessed to have that in my life. I'm blessed to have amazing mentors, teachers, instructors, um, guides in my life that have given me a lot of knowledge and a lot of wisdom. I'm thankful I have the technology needed to communicate. Amongst this pandemic, I am thankful I am here making YouTube videos for you guys and that I have the opportunity to share my life with you. I'm thankful that I can call anybody at any time because I have a cell phone. I am thankful that I have technology that can keep me alive for as a type 1 diabetic. Some people don't have that. Some people don't have the ability to access that. There's a lot of things to be thankful for. And I think if you take a moment and really look at the little things, I'm thankful that I can go, wake up every morning and see the sunshine. I'm thankful I can mow grass and that I don't have anything that would hinder me from able to mow grass, to be outside, to be active, and to be a helper in my community. There's a lot I'm grateful for. And I think there's a lot that we all should be grateful for, all the little things. Just think about it. I mean, I'm thankful I have clean water. Did you know a lot of people in this world do not have clean water to drink. I can go to my sink right now or my refrigerator and grab water if I want. Some people can't do that. Some people can't pursue a secondary education or college because it's just out of reach. Some people can't even get to a job because they may not have a reliable vehicle. Don't you think about that for just a think how many amazing things you have in your life and count those blessings because not everybody has the same opportunity. Even more importantly, I have a loving and dedicated God that has guided me through more than I'll ever experience. And I'm ending this more on a religious note, take it or leave it for what it's worth. But I have a strong foundation and a strong faith in God that he's gonna carry me through every situation I go through, whether that situation is a good situation or a bad situation, whether I'm getting tested in, through trial and tribulation or whether I'm going through a joyous period in my life I have God on my side and I have faith that all things are possible. I wanted to end with a <clears throat> an email that was sent to us by our college president. I'm not going to say his name. I'm Again, I'm not going to really say where I go to college. Um, I'm not going to say whether I really agree or disagree with this letter, but it gave me a different spin on how to look at the world from a little bit of a different angle. And this was in light of uh, the death of George Floyd. Now. There's different varying opinions on this, but no matter what you look at it, if you take more of a middle ground like I do, or if you're, you, ha you have a side, set that aside for a minute and just listen to this letter or this email he wrote to us. A call to action. My heart aches for our black brethren. I am brokenhearted for us. How do we get here? How do we come to live in a place where hate flourishes while we sit by and say nothing, do nothing as people are killed, brutalized, looked down upon, and denied basic human rights and the opportunities because of the color of their skin. It is easy to comfort ourselves by condemning the actions of others. But who among us hasn't switched sides of the street when we see a group of black youth or men walking our way? 
Who among us hasn't seen a black person and immediately asked ourselves if trouble is coming our way? How many of us have believed at some level that the plight of the black American is the fault of their own? Even as they disproportionately live in substandard housing, earn less, have less opportunity for their preschool children, and subsequently start out behind in school and rarely catching up? How many of us have thought to have conversations with our sons and daughters about not wearing hoodies, masks, or moving in any way that someone might consider threatening, such as leaning over your car in your car to get registration from the glove compartment? The sense of hopelessness, the feeling of helplessness must be overwhelming. And now we watch on TV for all the world to see a police officer murders a black person, a person already handcuffed and on the ground. This after innumerable stories of violence, racism, and imprisonment visited upon our black community. Instead of blaming the protesters for the violence and looting predicated by the protests, we must hold ourselves accountable for the actions and inactions we have individually and collectively taken that has led to this time. I do not condone the violence, but I can begin to understand the root of its cause. Thousands of people are protesting loudly but peacefully. Let us remember that they are asking for the same basic human rights that most of us can enjoy. We should not and cannot let the not denial of these rights continue. Racism, for that what it is, must be rooted out of our culture. Like most things cultural, this means every little thing or big offense, every inequity, no matter how large or small. Every perception held by each person must be examined and understood so that we may tear out all the beliefs and behaviors that reinforce the negative that has been visited on people of color. And then he says, as president of my college, I commit to you that the college and I will strenuously work each day to make this happen. Only in this way will we be able to stand hand in hand with our black brethren and all people of every color. Like I said, there's a lot of uh, different things going on with this letter. And I, like I said, there's parts I can see agreeing with and other parts, you know, you take for what it's worth, right? But I wanted to share this with you and just give you a different spin on it because whether or not what happened happened, whether or not one side is correct or another side is correct, one thing is for sure is that we all need to unite together and be peaceful to one another. Like there's no doubt in my mind that if anything comes out of this, is that to be kind to one another no matter who that person is? No matter what that person chooses to pursue, we don't need violence. We don't need hate. We don't need disrespect for other people. We don't need prejudice. And we certainly don't need people acting out on one another just because somebody's a little bit different. I want you to think about that. And I want to say how proud of my college I am. I'm proud to go to a college where they really embrace diversity and interacting with people of different cultures, different backgrounds. And I really enjoy that. And um, maybe I'll talk later on. I did have an experience with a totally different person that I never thought I would have experienced on a college campus. And it was a beautiful experience. Um, I'll talk more about that maybe in a different video. But for now, with that being said, a lunch jump into today's video. Hey all it's Maddie. Welcome or welcome back to my channel. Thank you for taking the time to reflect with me a little bit. I normally don't do this kind of stuff when I introduce my videos, but I just thought I had to share a little bit on the light and in lieu of what is going on in our world today. But if you made it this far within the first few minutes of this video, you are going to be coming along with me and I'm going to be explaining and sharing my experience in my second semester of dental hygiene school. I have my tooth t-shirt on here from Dental Hygiene Nation. Absolutely love it. Um, and obviously there's a little bit of a twist considering that a COVID-19 pandemic broke out um, and was deemed a worldwide pandemic on March 13th of this year. So uh, things kind of changed a little bit about halfway through our semester, uh, but I will do my darndest to explain each class that I went through and kind of how it went. And I really loved this semester. I thought it was super enjoyable, just as enjoyable as the next one, but as the last one, but obviously it's getting more and more challenging as we go, because obviously as you learn and grow as a student, you're going to be experiencing new things and challenging yourself in ways that you may have never thought you could. So I will start with this class because this is the binder I have right now. Pathology, oral pathology. And this class was a lot of fun. I um, I would say this class is probably one of the most challenging classes I took this semester. 
you have to learn about different lesions in the mouth, different radiographic um, abnormalities, normalities, oral abnormalities and normalities, and be able to identify them based on color, their texture, their size, whether or not they appear on an x-ray or a radiograph, whether or not they're present in certain races, certain gender, certain age groups, if, if there's more of a genetic predisposition for people to have these different types of, um, I guess, I, I want to say like developmental abnormalities or developmental um, conditions within the mouth, um, how to look for oral cancer, how to identify different uh, lesions that are associated with a particular disease, how to understand disease transmission and all these different things. So. This was my lovely binder, and all it literally has is reading guides from the different chapters. You learn so. things like tumor nomenclature, like what's oma versus sarcoma versus carcinoma. You know, is it benign? Is it cancerous? Learning like all the different genetic, possible genetic mutations and genetic um, like diseases and developmental problems that can cause different things to malform in the womb. It was a little bit more of a touch on. A review on embryology from oral anatomy and embryology and histology class. Um, learn about different diseases of the mouth, like impetigris, you call them herpes cold sores, things from fungal infections, like how to recognize yeast in people's mouths, to understanding maybe a little bit what certain medications do with patients. That is something more we learn about in dental pharmacology, but this was a really good, nice overview of how to look at different case studies and different images and, and the clinical application of seeing any abnormal or abnormal type um, lesion in a person's mouth. The big thing with this class was we had to put together this gigantic oral pathology portfolio. We had to turn it in online. Um, again, uh, this class was all lecture course basically and the tests were very tough. Um, because you have to be able to identify and pick out different lesions that are very similar to one another. We had to do like differential diagnoses where we had like four different conditions that may be possible for one picture and we had to try to rule them out based upon what does and what doesn't fit with the picture, the person's age, the person's background. Is the person a smoker? Is the person have any other risk factors that may put them at a higher risk for developing a certain lesion? But we had these all these different lesions we had to go through um, from tongue lesions to white spot lesions, pigmented lesions, um, connective tissue lesions, inflammatory soft tissue type lesions, ulcerative lesions, viral lesions, cysts um, that you might see on an x-ray, cancerous, precancerous type lesions, and like teeth alterations. There's actually some things that can go wrong genetically and in developmentally with the teeth. Um, I printed mine off so that I have to study it from boards, but we had to do a thing where you literally, she gave us this huge list and you had to go through and write the condition, have a picture, what the clinical appearance is, the ideology, meaning like how it originates and the treatment for it. And not every disease or lesion is gonna have an ideology. Not everything is gonna be like, oh, it comes from this and there's this kind of treatment. Well, that's not the case for it. Like geographic tongue, you may know about it basically. it's like an abnormal type formation on the tongue where you get like kind of like where like the tongue looks worn down it could look red it could look kind of like mucosally looking we don't know where it comes from it's just kind of a weird thing and some people have it some people don't and there really is no like treatment for it you can use palliative treatment if, if the patient finds it kind of sensitive or painful for certain foods but that's something you'd you don't treat. Unlike other lesions that may have cancerous lesions, like um, like squamous cell carcinoma, like that may have to be surgically excised. You might have to do chemotherapy, radiation, all those different things. There are things like carileukoplakia that tie along with like um, HIV and you know all these different things, or even Epstein Barr virus. I mean, there's a lot of different interconnections with this, and I really did well in this class, I think because I like looking at different pictures, I guess. Um, and I guess I really like understanding disease process. I don't know why I've always liked the idea behind like combining microbiology with like something I'm doing in my career, I guess, and like the little things that come together to make the big things, if that makes sense. Like, I hope I'm not going off on too much of a tangent, but this class really did suit me and not everybody is suited for oral pathology. Some people really, I either feel like you either really like the class or you really don't like this class. I don't know, but I think it'll be helpful. 
And I think this thing we made will be very helpful for boards. But yeah, I mean, it, it was like 43 pages I printed off, but like each thing, like seriously, like <laughs> we're, we're not even to the tooth alterations yet. But I mean, it is a thick, thick amount of pages. Like I can't even flip through the pages because they're so thick. There, there's a lot of your bone lesions that you would possibly see on an x-ray that would be abnormal. Things from normal cysts and abscesses that you could see um, to things like tumors that you can actually see present within the bones of the different, between the teeth or around the jaws, all these different things. The alterations of teeth, this is something I might see more commonly. There's things like anodontia, which is like missing your um, most commonly you're missing your lateral incisors, you have your canine central. Laterals are often missing, as you can see in this person here, they're missing tooth 7 and 10. Um, that is like a congenital thing. Uh, it's a genetic factor, it's usually kind of a randomized thing that happens in utero when baby is developing. They may have a couple missing teeth, those are very common. Also what is also common is to miss uh, permanent third molars, which are your wisdom teeth, some people don't have those, and also mandibular second premolars which would be this tooth right here. Sometimes those are congenitally missing as well. Some people have extra teeth. Some people have um, teeth that kind of have V-shaped notches in them. We call that abfraction. Some people have dental genesis and amalogenesis and perfecta where the dentin or the enamel is affected and it's thin, it's worn down. Some people have problems with the roots where they are absorbed externally or internally. Some people, um, if they were exposed to congenital syphilis, patients can end up with um, what we call Hutchinson's incisors or mulberry molars, where like the molars look almost like a berry, and the incisors or the front teeth kind of look like they have a little notch taken out of them. Um, and they'll kind of look like a little peg coming out of the gum tissue. Um, the only way you can really treat those is with cosmetic dentistry, either like restorations, maybe implants, maybe tooth extraction if the tooth isn't really that desirable for the person, um, especially if it's non-functional, stuff like that. So there's a lot of uh, tooth mal malformities that are caused by genetics, but are also caused by disease like syphilis. So um, that was basically oral pathology. And I personally, at first I wasn't so sure about taking it online, but it actually was okay to take it online. Um, I think I just personally got used to the whole taking online classes if that makes sense and again I think maybe I'll touch base at the end um, kind of how my clinic's gonna go and maybe how I felt about online schooling but so there's three other courses we took um, I did do a video on my karyology course which does count as like a spring course like as far as like financial aid is concerned and like the academic course load as far as like counting credits but that course was already completed and taken in January and I did do a video on that so you're welcome to go check that out if you want to know all about karyology and the study of um, dental cavities um, but the other three classes I took, I'm going to get into now, um, that would be dental health and nu dental health and nutrition, periodontology and process two, which is our clinic level two. Um, and I'm going to get into nutrition right away. This is my nutrition binder. Like I said, I'm kind of obsessed with keeping things like OCD anal type A personality, having binders for everything and color coding things. So my nutrition binder was yellow. And dental health nutrition was basically just understanding how what you eat vitamin wise and mineral wise, how it impacts your mouth and your whole body. Like I had to learn about how um, we balance meals to how to do a nutritional counseling for patients. That's something we have to do in our third and fourth semesters. We have to nutrition counsel certain patients that have meet certain criteria as far as their diet is concerned with their oral health. Um, and how like what you eat can really directly impact how your risk of cavities are, your risk of periodontal disease is. Um, I had to learn about how the different vitamins and minerals have different functions within the body and what happens when you have too much of a vitamin or a certain mineral, what not just if you have too little, um, what the toxicity levels are, what is, you know, the super duper diminished levels are and what it can do to your body if you get to extreme states of not having enough or way too much of a certain vitamin or mineral and i found this class to be very interesting we had to learn like how carbohydrates function 
proteins and fats function and you know stuff like with diabetes and stuff so I feel like the carbohydrates fats and protein stuff was kind of a review for me just because I literally live and deal with <laughs> watching my diet all the time and reading labels and stuff like that but it's always a good review to get that and I always find it very interesting um the perspective you get from a different person and how they teach it and um, I thought this class was pretty well put together and it was pretty good to do online for the most part because we basically had lots of quizzes, online assignments, uh, we had like reading guides. I always do did the reading guides because I'm one of these people like if a teacher or an instructor puts a resource out for me I'm gonna snag it and if I don't use it right away it's fine but at some point I probably will use it to study for for an exam or in my case could be a great boards reference for me because um, for dental hygiene, we have to take a written board, which basically covers everything that we literally learn about as far as lecture is concerned. And in any of the stuff I learn about in any of these courses that I've learned in my first year can apply. And I need to be able to retain that information and apply it to a um, case study or maybe apply it to a question and understand the differences between certain things and what the boards really focus on as far as different things related to health and nutrition, to oral pathology, to whatever class it is. got to really focus on what is important for Lord's exam is what you need to know for your career, right? You want to know what you, you need to know what you need to know for your career and you better know it well because you never know if you're going to need it to use it with a patient. So, um, I'm just going to, I don't think it really matters because it has, you guys know my full name anyway, it's Addie Nielsen. Um, but this was a vitamin and mineral classification list we had to do and it was one of our assignments and I printed it off because I thought it was helpful. All it literally is is going through the vitamins and minerals and understanding like what's their names, what's the role in the body, what are some good food sources, what your body requires it per day or per month, hyperstates, how, what is a toxicity level in hypostates, what's a, de what's a deficiency and what does that look like within the whole body but really understanding how much of a deficiency of a certain thing can mean into the mouth. For example, if you have like a vitamin B12 deficiency, you can have a little bit of uh, angular colitis, which is kind of like dried chapped um, lips right around the corners of your mouth, like kind of right here. I have a little bit of it. Um, I don't think I have a vitamin B12 deficiency because I do eat a very varied diet, but um, that's one of the things that, that you kind of look for as a hallmarker of that. Um, as far as the vitamin B12 deficiency, there are certain things like vitamin A, I believe is very, very important to... Maybe incorrect, but I believe vitamin A is very important for your salivary gland function. I think that was on... I got tested on that at some point. I'm not 100% sure. But I'm pretty sure there's a lot of different vitamins that literally, if you don't have enough, can impact your salivary function, your ability for you to taste to chew food, to um, digest food properly, and your digestion process starts in your mouth, right? So like you need to keep your mouth healthy and you need to keep your mouth in good shape, right? You need to keep it up to snuff or you're not going to be able to enjoy your life, you're not going to be able to eat. Um, keeping your mouth healthy is important for every part of your life. Huge one, vitamin C. If you're low on that, you might get what they know as scurvy. Basically, it presents itself as super duper bad gingival inflammation or gum tissue inflammation and uh, this was something seen back way back in the day with sailors when they didn't have access to fresh fruits or fresh vegetables or fresh sources of food vitamin c that's what that's what's present um that's what needs to be present in order to have vitamin c present in a food the food needs to be some sort of fresh produce product often not found when you're sailing for months and months on the sea as a sailor uh, so they would often present with scurvy it could also lead to poor wound healing, bruising, fatigue. It can lead to an iron deficiency. So there's so many different things that like if you don't have certain levels of vitamin C and you don't replenish that daily within your body, how big of an impact that can have on your, on your mouth and your whole body. And if it has an impact on your whole body, it certainly has an impact on your mouth. And to me, if it has an impact on your mouth, it can certainly have an impact systemically. We're finding a lot of links between the the health of your mouth and the health of your heart. They're finding a lot of the links between the health of your mouth to the health of your skin. I mean, there's so many different connections that the mouth has to the body. The mouth is really a window to the health of the rest of your body. And I really think that's what this class emphasized. And like I said, I found this class to be a partial review, but also a really good um, 
a really good class to understand the connection to nutrition and the mouth. Like, you don't realize how much little things can impact this mouth. You think it's just brushing and flossing. No, it's what you put in your body that can make a huge difference of what's going on in your mouth. It can make a difference in how well you're healing. You think about patients like me with type 1 diabetes. Um, if my blood sugar's out of whack, it can sure make a big impre impression out of my mouth if I'm eating things like carbohydrates and sugars and not taking insulin, my blood sugar goes high. Well, my mouth can dry out. Having a dry mouth can cause all kinds of damage to the inside of my mouth. I have a high risk of cavities. Um, and obviously eating sugary foods and not so healthy foods for you puts an acid attack on the teeth and can certainly have cause you to have a higher risk of cavities. Um, big connection between food and cavities, but there's also a big connection between food and periodontal health. So like eating more of your fibrous food. The hard, crunchy, fibrous foods like are really good at preventing periodontal disease because they're really good at strengthening the muscles and the jaw and the supporting structures around the teeth called your periodontium. And if you're strengthening that bone, you're gonna prevent that bone from having a less likely of de degrading and degenerating. Uh, periodontal disease is caused by a variety of different things, but that's just one extra little thing that can help strengthen that and lessen your chance of periodontal disease. So that was nutrition um, for dental health, and this was the book we used. It's kind of a tiny little book, but it, like I said, it went. It was very, very nice because it literally laid things out in such a perfect way. This is what this is, and this is what this does. This is what this vitamin is, and this is what this vitamin does. So um, yeah, I thought dental health nutrition was interesting in a way. And like I said, it was more of a review for me and then kind of like really applying it to my career, if that makes sense. Another class that we took uh, was periodontology, which basically is the study of all the supporting and surrounding structures of your mouth, including your the ligaments, the tissues, um, the gums, the bone that literally hold your teeth in place. Your teeth aren't just floating around in your gum tissue. They are sur surrounded by supportive structures, ligaments, bone, gum tissue, all that comprises of what we call the periodontium and periodontology is the study of the periodontium and kind of what affects it, what doesn't. We had to learn like the microscopic anatomy to um, all these different locational points microscopically to um, what causes periodontal disease, what can influence a person's ability to have periodontal disease. It could be genetic related, it's often related to how much plaque and calculus they have, or plaque and tartar that they have. Plaque can also be referred to as biofilm. Um, people that smoke are at a very high risk of having periodontal disease. It just seems to break the bone down uh, at a much faster rate so that they have a higher chance of having periodontal disease, which means that they could eventually have so much bone loss that the tooth teeth start to become loose within uh, the supporting structure, then they can lose teeth. People with uncontrolled diabetes ding 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 type 1 diabetic here um people with uncontrolled type 1 or type 2 diabetes um if your blood sugars are really really high it seems to have an inflammatory effect on your gum tissue and it can slowly over time degrade the bone and wear it down to nothing um but if you are well controlled like myself your risk of periodontal disease is no different than a person um without any other health conditions so keep those blood sugars in check you guys get those highs down right and brush your teeth keep your exams going for your dental cleanings and you can see your dentist regularly um, to avoid all those possible complications related to your periodontal health uh, we went into different things that can be used to help treat patients with periodontal disease we had to go through and make a chemotherapeutic reference manual which i printed off too like my vitamin and mineral chart because i thought it would be a good reference to study from clinically uh, we had to go through things and talk about like chlorhexidine, which is a type of mouth rinse to perio chip, something that we'll have to place in our patients, I believe, next semester uh, on a very specific patient with really deep periodontal pockets for scaling and root planing. We kind of went through what that's about, what its benefits are. We went through various non-surgical non periodontal therapy to surgical periodontal therapy, what that looks like. Um, scaling and root planing is basically a big old long-term what we abbreviate as SRP, which is basically a deep cleaning. So we basically get on the root surface and remove any tartar, any plaque that's on there, smooth it down to make it a healthier environment for that attachment to return. Um, and if the patient complies with their brushing and flossing and they're coming in regularly, 
a uh, good chance we can restore some of the damage that has happened. We can't reverse the bone loss with periodontal disease, periodontitis or the inflammation of the periodontal tissues, but we can slow down what is happening, but we can't reverse what has already happened, but we can stop more from happening, if that makes sense. Like gingivitis is the inflammation of just the gum tissue when there's actually no bone loss at that point. There's just really bleeding, often swollen, irritated gum tissue. Could have a little bit of pus in it. That is also reversible with maybe good brushing and flossing techniques to maybe a person's medication changes to seeing a dentist more frequently can all help reverse that gingival disease process. But anyway, I was talking about this type of chemotherapeutic type treatment is called Arrestin and it's basically like a little microbial um, antibiotic that is placed right into the periodontal pocket that is deeper than five millimeters. And it basically allows um, the person to have an elimination of certain bacteria that really do aggravate and can cause the disease process of periodontal disease. And like I said, that is another factor for periodontal disease. Some people have higher uh, levels of certain bacteria that are known to cause periodontal disease, that are known to break down that bone, that are known to attack the tissues that, the tissues that surround the tooth, um, any tooth, I guess you could say. But placing that can actually help a person um, in their process of slowing down their periodontal disease. We also do things like tobacco cessation with our patients, really in stressing the importance that if they do smoke or use a tobacco product, that includes chewing tobacco, smokeless tobacco, cigarettes, cigars, you name it. Anything that has to do with tobacco products, if they're consuming that, that literally is putting a huge impact on their oral health. and. The bone is going to break down a lot faster. If you imagine if you're putting all those chemicals right inside your mouth, like how is your mouth going to respond? Like the bone and the tissues aren't going to like it and they're going to want to retreat away from it. That's how I like to think about it. Like that's to me why that bone is going to break down so quick. Like why would what your body doesn't want to be under an environment toxic environmental situation. So it's going to retreat away from it. So we really want to emphasize the fact of really um, hitting home with our patients that smoke tobacco, just how dangerous it can really be. Not only for a lot of people understand it for their lungs and their systemic health, but how important it is for your oral health because periodontal disease is one of those very slow progressing diseases that often is treated until it often isn't sought out for help until it's too late because it can often be non-painful to start slowly losing that bone. Only then when the patient starts losing teeth or they may start experiencing some sort of pain or sensitivity that they really do come in and at that point it may be too late to reverse the damage um, or slow that damage down. I should say you can't reverse the bone loss, but it may be too late to reverse them back to a somewhat healthier state or help improve them at any point. They may be too far gone for us to help them with. Uh, so we really want to emphasize the importance of them coming in regularly and checking up on that oral cavity as much as possible. Um, so that was another huge part of periodontology. This class again wasn't too bad to take online. Um, we had a couple like, um, I'm trying to think, call them like WebExes or like webinars with a couple guest speakers who were super helpful, like representative for arrest and came in and talked about it. Um, that's something again, we'll have to place in our patients as an experience, which is going to be super cool to really see that treatment be put into action and to really apply what you do periodontally to um, in this class to what you do periodontally with a patient when you're assessing their gum tissue. It was really making a huge importance of that the tissue, it's not only just the teeth, it's the tissues that surround the teeth. You need to keep the whole thing healthy in order to keep those individual teeth healthy, right? It's not just looking at one thing, it's looking at the whole perspective. Um, like I said, I really like this class and I feel like periodontology and oral pathology, was, again, it's one of those classes you either loved it or you hated it or you got it or you didn't. I feel like that's how it was personally that I, in my opinion, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe some of you are like, oh yeah, I kind of got understood some concepts of this and maybe not so much the concept of that. But for me, like, I don't know. I just like grabbed onto it and I'm, I'm always fascinated with like the scientific processes again behind disease and disease process. So maybe that's why I just latched onto these classes and really enjoyed them. <laughs> I just bumped my knee into my closet. Um, but maybe that's why I really did well in these classes because I really enjoy these types of and things. And of course, the main thing clinically with this was learning how to stage and grade periodontitis. What makes fast progressing periodontitis, what makes it slower. 
um, what kind of periodontal measurements uh, put you at different stages. Like stage one is not as bad of a stage as stage four, if that makes sense. So we stage it to based on where they are at clinically, and we also grade them to see how rapidly they're progressing through the periodontal disease process or periodontitis. Um, and once you're in periodontitis, you're stuck in it. You know, the only thing that you can really do is you can keep yourself at that level. For example, uh, I have a patient who has periodontal disease, but I don't believe it's active um, because the amount of bone loss present in the x-rays was not that much, and I don't foresee it being that much considering that um, this patient has good home care. This patient is regularly coming in. I don't foresee any issues, but that's something, again, we monitor. And again, I'm being very general with what I'm saying patient-wise because I don't want to break HIPAA compliance, but that's kind of stuff that you look at versus somebody who's a smoker. Um, we may want to watch them more closely because who knows when we take x-rays again the next time, they could progress to a different stage and grade of periodontitis. Um, but again, with the patient that I'm seeing that has periodontitis uh, right now, it's not that severe, and I feel like it's arrested. Um, where I don't foresee any more bone loss in the future, and I'm not, I had to point out to this patient, yes, there is bone loss, but I don't foresee it getting worse if you continue your good home care, if we really focus on the areas that need to be focused on, if you're coming in regularly and having your gum tissue assessment done at your recalls, I don't foresee any more problems. And just again, rechecking all those measurements, because if all of a sudden a pocket in her mouth goes from four to six in the next appointment, I'm gonna be concerned. I'm gonna wonder, okay, what is going on here that all of a sudden her pocket went from a four, which is unhealthy, to a six, which is even more unhealthy. Um, we wanna see pockets between one and three. And we also look at recession, how far away the gum tissue is pulled away from the tooth and the, where the tooth and the root meet. We call that the CEJ. If the gum tissue is pulled away from it, we call that recession. We also have to look and see how much MGJ is attached. Um, MGJ is just a big old term for mucal gingival junction, which is kind of actually really noticeable. It's that line right here. It's kind of where the pink and purple meet. Um, really noticeable on your front teeth. So if you ever pull your gum tissue up and look at that, that's what the MGJ is, that kind of prominent line. When we're measuring that, um, obviously you want to see good measurements of that because that means you have good attachment. When you start getting smaller and smaller amounts, that means you're losing attachment level between the tooth and the gum tissue and the supporting structure. So that's something we watch with too with any person in periodontal disease. And once you're in periodontal disease, like I said, you can't get out of it, but you can kind of arrest it and stop it. You can't reverse what, like if you were in stage two already, you can't really go back to healthy. You know, like you're going to have period, if it's just bone loss, there's bone loss and it's gone. You can't magically grow that bone back. If the bone level on this tooth is down to here, which is like 50% bone loss. Um, that's another thing we learned is how to interpret percentage of bone loss. You're not going to get that back. You're not going to magically go back up to 0%. Okay, you're going to be at 50. What we don't want is to continue to progress, 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 progress to get to 100 and then the tooth falls out. If you're at 50%, not ideal. You're going to have a lot of recession going on. You're going to have some exposed root. But if we can maintain that 50%, that's our goal. We don't want the disease pro process to progress any further. So that was a huge thing, periodontology. Like I said, I'm probably going all over the place with this video. If you're in dental hygiene school, you're probably really enjoying this. If you're not, you're probably like, holy crap, is she going to school to be a doctor? No, I'm not going to school to be a doctor. I promise you, I'm not going to school to be a doctor and I couldn't go to school to be a doctor. That's another video for another day. Why Maddie did not go to school to be a doctor. Um, but no, this is just a lot of involved stuff and don't ever think that dental hygienists just clean teeth. We have to know a lot. We have to know a lot about oral cancer to periodontal health, to what can affect your periodontal health, to what is normal, what is abnormal, what is healthy, what is not healthy, how to interpret x-rays, how to come up with a treatment plan for a patient, how to talk to a patient, how to educate a patient. I could go on and on and on all night about what a dental hygienist does, but I'm going to end it here. And I'm going to move on to the last and final class I took for the semester, process two, which is our clinic level. Process two, this is my process two binder. Yes, I have cute little mouth rinses, toothpaste, toothbrush, floss. Is that a mirror? Yeah. And a little happy mirror on my pictures because, again, I'm cute and I like to make things look cute when I do my binders. Um, but anyways, we really focused on 
the ca process of care for a patient in this class, the lecture portions of it anyway. Uh, we learned about tobacco cessation. We learned about different toothpaste, toothbrushes, mouth rinses that really are good. Um, interdental aids like floss, floss threaders, floss picks that we can use to help a patient uh, continue their good home care at home, how to educate a patient. We learned about uh, ultrasonic, which is basically a powered instrument instead of hand scaling with these babies. Um, you can use ultrasonic instrumentation on certain patients um, and get the opportunity to use it on a patient and stuff like that. Um, how to place sealants, how to do airflow, desensitization, um, understanding like patients who have dental dentinal hypersensitivity and how Sensodyne can really help with that. You know, all these different, you know, what the ingredients are in different types of toothpaste and toothbrushes and how it impacts the mouth. Not every patient is going to be able to be on the same toothpaste or toothbrush, just depending on their oral health, for example. Um, people that have recession should not be on a toothpaste like a, a whitening toothpaste because the ingredients in those um, can basically do tons of damage and be super duper sensitive to that area of recession. We want to put them on a fluoride, fluor, fluorinated toothpaste with um, potassium nitrate, usually 5%, and that's usually Sensodyne, and that is obviously going to be a little bit more protective to that exposed tooth surface um, that normally is not exposed to the outside oral cavity. So when they do brush and floss, they're not going to create that sensitivity when they're going in between the teeth or going around the teeth or going at the gum line. We want to make sure they're getting the right type of toothpaste, the right type of interdental aid, the right type of mouthwash, because not every patient's needs are the same. Patients, you need different treatment plans. No two patients are the same, therefore you need no, no two treatment plans are the same. We kind of went over how dental fear and anxiety, we had, um, this is something we'll learn about in dental anxiety and pain management, pain management and how to exactly go about this. But we got a brief introduction on nitrous oxide to local anesthetics and all those different things. Uh, we learned in clinical wise how to do take intraoral uh, photos on our patient, how to use the ultrasonic. And then um, when we go back next week, we will finish up our instrumentation evaluations that we would normally do on our patients. Um, and we also learn how to place sealants and do uh, our airflow and desensitization on a mannequin because right now, because of COVID-19, we can't do anything that produces aerosols, meaning no polishing, no ultrasonic, no airflow, desensitization, anything that's going to produce tons of spray and water and droplets and aerosols, we cannot do it this time to prevent the spread of COVID-19. Um, also in this class, we did a little bit of different things. We did our clinic exit outcome exam online we did case studies which i thought were super helpful and it's a really good way to you get a picture of like somebody's x-rays somebody's intraoral photographs their um periodontal pocket depths probing depths their gum tissue assessment and a little bit of a history on the patient with their age the medical history medications they take and you have to answer a series of anywhere from five to fifteen questions in I really like the case studies and they seem to make sense to me and that's a very much a clinical application. Uh, we also learned about too in this class how to deal with pediatric patients. That's something that's huge that I forgot to talk about um, because the pediatric patients or patients that are under the age of 18 or patients with orthodontics are going to need a little bit more uh, different care than an adult patient. Um, what you might see clinically may be a little bit different in those patients and stuff like that. Obviously, teeth size, teeth numbers, the amount of teeth, um, how they uh, react in the dental chair. Like I said, how to communicate with our patients was part of this too. How to ask patients questions. Because um, you want to be able to educate your patients and ask patients questions without making them feel like they're doing a bad job or anything like that. No, your patients aren't doing a bad job. Um, but as I always say, there's always room to improve. Even for someone like myself, who is a dental hygienist in training, like one more year and I will be a hygienist, I still make mistakes with brushing my teeth. There are some days where I'm like, oh no, um, I didn't brush this area good enough. And I can really, I can, sometimes I can feel the amount of uh, sticky plaque that is building up there. Oh crap. Um, I shouldn't have rinsed my mouth out with this because now I'm just going to create an acid attack on my teeth or I'm like, oh no. You know, I, I think more scientifically when it comes to that stuff, but I, I still make mistakes. There are areas in my mouth I probably need to focus on brushing and flossing a little bit better. But it's all about recognizing where you need to improve and improving it and taking one step at a time. A patient overnight isn't going to go from 
having one area of the mouth miraculously plaque free the next time you see them. You want to see improvements. You want to see a better. You want to see a change. You want to see them better themselves in their oral home care. You want to give them access to the resources that they may need, uh, the care that they may need um, to help keep that oral health up to date, up to snuff, healthy looking because this, like I said, this mouth, it tells all. And it can be a sign for a lot of other health problems too. I mean, heck, I had a yeast infection in my mouth before I had type 1 diabetes just beforehand. And I had my teeth cleaned just before I was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. As a matter of fact, two days. The hygienist didn't even realize I had yeast in my mouth and it was clearly in my mouth. The only thing she noticed is that I had no saliva in my mouth, um, which is not normal for me. I'm a huge saliva producer. Anybody who's been in my mouth in my class, you know I produce saliva. It is not normal for someone like me to not have saliva. She should Maybe she should have said, you know, this, something's not right. But no, she chose to ignore it <laughs> or whatever the case may be or didn't think that it was a healthy thing. So noticing those little changes in your patients and saying, oh, is this caused from a medication? Is this caused maybe by an underlying health condition that's not diagnosed? Stuff like that. And she even noticed I was really tired. Like someone like me who really enjoys going to the dentist should not be tired when she gets her teeth cleaned. She should be really enjoying it, right? So what's going on here and what you're seeing here can really see affect what's going on here. And I think it's very important that as a hygienist in training, or as if you're a hygienist now, really look at the patient and be like, hello, there may be something more going on. Not that I can diagnose a patient with a chronic condition, but I can say, you know, there's something not right. This doesn't look normal. I would get this further looked at. I would make a referral maybe to a doctor. You know, there's something not going on right with what I'm seeing clinically is not normal and I would, or is not ideal and I'd like for you to get a further investigation. So that is why it's important to educate your patients on what can and cannot cause possible changes in their mouth, what can and cannot damage the mouth, uh, what can and cannot um, help them out um, both in their home care and when they're actually coming to see you. I have to say that I um, process too is good. Um, because, like, we didn't have to go through, like, learning any different new tools or anything other than, like, the ultrasonic and, like, taking pictures and doing a couple things with, like, sealant placements, which we'll do next week. Um, but I definitely way enjoy, mo mo I enjoy being in the clinical setting way more, like, to me, like, I'm a hands-on person, like, doing this lecture stuff to me is, like, not as exciting, like, I can understand it, but anything clinically... I can pick up on pretty quick and like manipulate an instrument, but you give me like 30 terms to memorize for a certain chapter, I'm kind of like, eh. Like I'll, I can do it, don't get me wrong, but it's just like not as appealing to go through the lecture stuff. And that's what made dealing with this class the hardest with COVID-19 is like, because you kind of had to treat, you kind of had to teach yourself a little bit you had to read the material like yeah I always ask my instructors like email them if I had a question or a concern but I was like I felt like I was teaching myself and because I wasn't in the clinical setting applying it I'm kind of like well what's the point of learning about it <laughs> if I'm not going to be able to apply it yet or thanks COVID for screwing up everybody's life kind of thing there was a point where I was like what's the point of doing it but I'm like you know what? you got to push through at some point you're going to apply this clinically and the time is almost here and I'm super duper excited uh, to be going back to my clinicals and just treating my patients and spending chair time with my patients and enjoying that part of my experience in dental hygiene school and what I'll be doing in real life. Like the clinical aspect is so much fun. Um, if you didn't see my little friend that I was holding up in my thumbnail, the stand is actually right there and he kind of slips on that stand, but this is, I say hello to Kevin. I named him Kevin. Um, this is literally a type of knot on a stick <laughs> with cheeks and lips and equipped with wisdom teeth because he has his third molars back here. He is one through 32. This is a full adult mouth. Um, I don't even have a full adult mouth because I don't have my third molars. I don't have my wisdom teeth. Those got extracted a couple years ago. Actually, it was nearly five years ago that they've been extracted um but anyways this is what we got back in may to help practice our instrumentation on until we get back in the clinical setting and let me tell you it's been super helpful if you can't see already these teeth are plastic but if you can't see the little 
scratch marks. It tells you how much I've been using my scalers and my curettes and probing around in this guy and playing around in this guy. And I can't wait until this is a human mouth and not a, not a Kevin Kilgore. And this is a, these are Kilgore scans, so I named him Kevin Kilgore. So this is my friend Kevin, like I said, equipped with wisdom teeth and a uvula. I mean, this is literally a fake uvula, you guys. Like, <laughs> what type of yawn doesn't have a fake uvula to go along with it? Um, but the jaw stays locked, and then he slips on the stand, and I can rotate him up and down, left and right, so that I can work on either the bottom jaw, which is what we call the mandible, or the upper jaw, which is what we call the maxilla. This jaw move, does not move. This is the jaw that moves. That allows you to talk. This jaw is implanted in part of your skull. <laughs> this is on a hinge. And it allows you to move. As a matter of fact, I have clicking in my right side, and I have had clicking in my right side for a long time in my temporal mandibular joint, if you want to know some FYI in that. Um, but every week we've been going through with our one of our instructors and going through instrumentation, and I've been practicing on him like crazy. Um, I did do a lot of outside practice prior on mannequins too, so I took a little bit to get back into the swing of things, but I feel like my instrumentation skills are just as strong as they were when I left clinic. And um, it was kind of a crazy experience. Like my last day at school ever was the, I think, right, was it the day? I think it was the day that coronavirus was declared a pandemic. That was March 13th, I believe. If I'm incorrect, I'm going to put like a thing here. But I uh, it was the last time I ever saw a patient in clinic and we had a little like, um, like rumor had it that my college was going to be like extending spring break because of like coronavirus and all that. And then we had like a little huddle with our teacher and she's like, um, just so you know, make sure you have everything off campus. They're extending spring break. And I don't know how this whole coronavirus thing is going to pan out, but um, please stay away from other people. Stay healthy, stay safe. And that was it. We transitioned to all online courses after that. And we had no clue what our clinicals were going to do. Process four or the second year students just finished all their stuff up and they will take their clinical board in August. So good luck to them. Congratulations to those lovely ladies. You earned it. You did really well this year and um, this semester. And I'm proud of each and every one of you for getting through the program. And next year I will be in their shoes along with all my other classmates. Um, so... It was kind of everything was up in the air, wasn't sure when we were going to go back. We weren't even sure how things were going to go as far as different things. Like at one point, in, um, they broke us up into five groups, and my group was going to be in the dental assisting clinic, but now that they don't have to do that because we got enough appropriate circulation and airflow in the dental hygiene clinic where we can all be here and there, and they're putting up plexiglass and adding all these filtration units and Things are constantly changing with COVID. Um, there was a thing that just changed. Like at one point we had to wait like 15 minutes before we could like start disinfecting our operatories after we finished a patient. Now we don't have to do that. Um, you don't have to wait 15 minutes for any aerosol particles to just drop and land. So that's kind of a nice thing. So like things are constantly changing by the CDC. And at one point we couldn't see patients above 65 because they were too high of a risk of COVID-19. And now you can if you get a med consult. And everything is just constantly changing. And it's just kind of like, I want to pull my hair out. Um, but that's a pandemic, right? Everything is ever so changing. And we need to be flexible. We need to be patient. We need to be understanding that things change. The only thing that doesn't change is that I still will have this guy named Kevin, and here I am playing with Kevin as I'm talking to you. Um, but anyways, that is how COVID-19 kind of panned out for us, and it was kind of an abrupt thing, and all of a sudden we got thrown into all our other classes, got turned into online courses. One part of our periodontology class was supposed to be a clinical-based thing with a patient, I think, yes. But that obviously got discontinued because of COVID-19, so that part was... Um, omitted and we did something else in place of that the only thing is i kind of feel sorry for our teachers because any changes they make to our curriculum they have to update to the state because like obviously i get a license in this state um there's a national license part like li licensure part of it but because i'm in the state of wisconsin wisconsin dental laws and dental hygiene practicing laws are a little different than other states um, but anything that they change, they got to update to the board and the board's got to approve or disapprove of all the different changes. They have to record, we have to record how many hours we have in clinicals and what we do for those hours and stuff like that. 
you have to meet so many hours before you graduate you have to have so many different patient age experiences to uh, patients with different stages of periodontal health and all these different things so kind of crazy how dental hygiene school works and again i think as i go more and more forward i will start slowly um, opening up a little bit more about how <laughs> stressful it can be but you know what it's going to be so worth it and i absolutely love what i do and there's no doubt that i'm in the right path career path um i will say at one point i actually got so bummed out about this whole coronavirus thing that i just didn't have the motivation at one point for one week to do anything not like i wasn't doing my classwork but it was just like mentally i was just not in a right place like mentally i was like Damn, you should have just chose a different career path. Because <laughs> um, it looks like dental hygiene is such a high risk now. Like, you're going to end up getting sick with COVID or you're going to end up <laughs> having so many problems or whatever. Um, but it really isn't that much of a risk anymore considering we have the proper PPE. We need the N95s, the face shields, um, glasses as usual, hair bouffant, lab jacket gloves i mean it's it's like a whole work and you literally we can't recognize each other when we have all these things on um and i'm gonna be hot as heck come july but uh keep your fingers crossed i'm gonna make it through july here as best as i can my clinics are monday and wednesday all day every day monday wednesday only actually so it's like a instead of doing like one week of hygiene we're basically cramming two weeks of hygiene into one week so that we get everything all done in July and then August starts the new semester and kind of crazy how that flies um and how the time is flying but anyways if you saw my intro picture beyond Kevin you saw that I also have some special looking glasses which you may or may not have seen if you're on my Instagram or whatever these are loops um these are by Oroscoptic and I got fitted for these I think about a month before the pandemic broke out and I ordered them right away and they came here actually right when we started safer at home or when this first thing broke out like at the end of march ish and i said at one point i got so bummed out and depressed i couldn't even look at this um thing uh just as maddie rdh but i couldn't even look at my like container because i was like like so upset about the whole situation i didn't even want to look at my loops i didn't even want to practice anything I didn't even want to like look at my instruments it was at the point of I didn't want to do anything but anyways what these are is just like magnification um these are actually fitted right for your eyes so when you look through them everything like right about here on my hand is magnified so that when I go into the mouth with an instrument I actually have a good handle of like what I'm able to actually see gives me a really good idea of how well I'm putting the instrument to the person's tooth is it adapted right I can actually read the periodontal probe without going, is that a three? Is that a four? Hmm, I think that's a five. I don't know. I'm going to guess and say it's a six. Um, but no, I really don't struggle with without the loops, but they're going to be super helpful. And the, the most exciting part about it is the light. Oh. As soon as I get the light on, woo, kind of bright, isn't it? Let me adjust it. But you adjust it to where you can actually see it right through the magnifiers and it goes right through and it makes a nice clear picture like a binocular. You have a nice clear tunnel vision of what you're looking at in the mouth also very good to help your posture because without these you're kind of forcing yourself to either look down maybe you're turning your head funny maybe you're turning your back funny but with these because it's so it's sorted for a it's fitted for my working distance when i'm working on a patient it forces me to keep my body like this like i can't tilt my head down can't tilt my head up i can't you know do anything else like that i hope the light isn't driving you crazy um but anyways, I it allows me to keep my posture in such a better shape. But this is the light that it comes with, and I'm super excited to use this along with the dental light. Because for heaven's sake, I'm one of these people that cannot adjust the dental light to save her soul. Um, I can adjust it and do pretty well. But then, like, they'll my one of my instructors will come and switch it on me, and it's like, excuse me, I thought I had it right. And it turns out I had it the backwards way or something. Um but that'll be a nice addition to the actual dental light because um, I feel like I can get it right or like I'll put my hand in the person's mouth with an instrument and it'll block my light or like I'll adjust it like I said and it'll be not quite in the right spot and then they'll totally way adjust it differently on me and I'm like, mm, no, I can't see at all. <laughs> so this is going to be a really good adjustment to have a little extra lighting. Um, 
these babies aren't cheap, just so you guys know. You want to know how much I paid for them? It was, um, I, I tell you how much I paid for them. I paid for them in full, by the way. They're all mine. I paid them off several months, a couple months ago. Um, you could do like a payment plan, but I had enough to do it all up at once at the time. You want to know how much I paid for these? $30 in tax. Um, and this is actually a student discount. And what's nice is that the light came with it, which it wasn't like an extra surcharge. I can't remember the specifics, but like the fitting and like my um, measurements, like from my working distance and, you know, the height of my eyes and my pupils and, you know, all like on my face is like different than everybody else's, right? So all that was basically added in. But for a student, it was much cheaper. I paid $1,451. And 50 cents for these babies so you think i'm gonna save these with my life you bet your bottom dollar i'm gonna take care of these i have not used these on an actual patient yet will i use them when we go back i don't really think so at this point because i feel like i don't have quite enough i don't feel like i have quite enough practice on a um kevin yet uh, i've been practicing them quite a bit but one thing is for sure like if any of you my first get loops you're going to feel kind of dizzy when you first use them. Like you got to get used to looking through a small area. And if you're not careful, you can get really dizzy and lightheaded and you're like, holy crap. <laughs> um, so I try to like only play with the loops and like practice on areas of the mouth that I have mastered without the loops and the areas of the mouth that I'm still focusing on um, that are a little bit more of a challenge for me. Not saying that I can't do it, but like that may be a little bit more of a challenge with the loops, I'm doing it without until I can get myself back into the groove of working in certain areas a little bit more proficiently and a little bit quicker. Um, so then I'm slowly incorporating the loops with it, but they're amazing and I'm so glad I made the investment and I got to, you get to choose like the frame and these are called the RDH Elites. They're kind of a big faced frame. And I don't know why I'm obsessed with big framed things. I think they just look good on me. I don't know why. If I had to choose glasses, I would get the big frame glasses. So I'm like, you know what? If you're going to wear a pair of cute glasses, you might as well make them look cute for you, right? And what's super cool is on the side, it says Maddie RDH. I don't know if you guys can see it. It's right there. And then I've got the purple ones, and it's kind of got like a rainbow color inside. Purple is the color of dental hygiene, if you didn't know. And purple is one of my favorite colors. Um, so... I am absolutely obsessed with these. And if, by the way, if I didn't say the brand, it's Oroscoptic. That's the loop company that rep that comes to our school. I know there's other ones like Q-Optic and it's another big one that I can't think of right now off the top of my head. But anyways, um, they were really friendly and everything. And I'm more than pleased with my loops and they're going to be very helpful for my career. And like I said, it, it was $1,400, but it's an investment. My career is going to invest in my posture, invest in my ability to see and maintain proper instrumentation in a person's mouth to being able to see all that super calc. Um, because pr quite frankly, I'll tell you a little trick that you can't really see the calculus that sits above the gum line very well, just by looking and feeling and air drying. Um, there were several areas I missed in a patient's mouth um, because they were kind of hidden. And without loops, I probably wouldn't have been able to see them anyway. Maybe I could have felt them, but they were so, like, minuscule and tucked underneath, like, in between the teeth that without loops, like, I wouldn't have been able to see them. So I'm very excited that I think this is really going to help me be proficient in detecting tartar and plaque, but it also will make me proficient at removing the tartar and plaque. Um... Like I said, it really helps magnify the ends of your instruments really well. And I still have my practice kit, y'all. Woot woot. I actually need to sharpen these instruments. But um, like I said, we're going to finish our instrumentation and do our clinicals in July. And look forward to a part two of this video once I get my clinical hours finished. How that kind of went um, post-COVID. Kind of how we're dealing with um, di dentistry and COVID-19. Uh, again, not really nothing to be concerning about so long as we are following as many guidelines, appropriate guidelines as possible. And again, these guidelines can change regularly. So as the guidelines change, things need to change. Uh, we're going to be very careful on our disinfection. Patients need to be temperature checked. Patients need to be asked screening questions. We need to be temperature checked, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so anyways... I hope you guys enjoyed this very, very long video. Um, second semester was very interesting. Finished all the lecture classes the last half online. I did very well, um, considering I taught myself a lot. 
and I'm very proud of my class and I'm proud of any of you that have done online schooling whether it be for regular high school middle school college you name it I'm proud of you because you know what the online schooling thing was not an easy thing for me to jump into either like and it's not my favorite thing either like when we do meetings with our teacher like I feel like I it's not my favorite thing like I do YouTube videos right like you think I'd be very comfortable with sitting down in front of a camera and talking with other people but for me like getting on a big group chat like that is just not for me right and I've, I've learned that I really and really appreciate being able to see people in person and talk to people in person and not over a screen um, or doing homework over a screen but we did find out today that all of our classes for next semester which um, require a lecture type format or lecture base um, will be online and then clinicals we are in clinicals instead of three times a week we are in clinicals four times a week we are getting front loaded um, which basically means that we will be done with our clinicals in early November instead of mid-December. Um, it will add a little extra stress trying to find um, some extra patients, but you know what? I would rather be done in November in case, heaven forbid, that another uh, second wave of COVID-19 tends to break out in this state. Every state's different, so again, I'm, I'm just going to say for the state of Wisconsin, we're doing okay right now. Not the worst, but we're certainly not the best. Um, but heaven forbid we get a really gigantic second wave and that we need to shut down schools again for whatever reason to disinfect, to keep people safe, to um, protect the public. Um, our clinical hours will all be done at the beginning of November instead of the mid-December. So um, then for heaven forbid that we needed to shut down in November that we could um, and finish all of our lecture stuff through December so that it doesn't drag me or the new incoming class any further behind with their stuff. Um, the new incoming class is just going to end up doing all their uh, pre-clinic stuff in one day, like on just Tuesdays, um, because normally they'd have the clinic Tuesday, Friday. Uh, first years have, normally have the clinic Tuesday, Friday. Second years normally have it Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, but because we're getting front-loaded with extra clinical time to prevent any possible having to make up clinic at a different time due to possible COVID-19 um, second wave, they got all their stuff bumped to Tuesday. So uh, this next semester will be interesting. This summer finishing up P2 clinicals will be interesting. Um, but I am proud of myself and I am proud of all my classmates because you know what, this was a very, very difficult thing to go through considering the circumstances with COVID-19 and I'm proud of them and proud of myself. And you know what, we got this. We're gonna get through it. And next year is gonna be a great year because <laughs> I'll be graduated and I will be on to bigger and better things, right? I, I love my schooling though and I couldn't have chose a better career path for me. So anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed this really long video. If you did, give it a big thumbs up. Feel free to hit that subscribe button. I post videos every single week about diabetes plus more about my life, including dental hygiene school. Um, stay tuned. Like I said, once July is over, I will post a little bit about how my second... Um, round of clinicals is going post COVID here uh, finishing up what we had from process two or clinic two um so that'll be interesting like I said I'm not too worried um like I said I'm in there Monday Wednesday all day long to make up everything and next week I'm only in there one day a week to make up our one part of our clinical setting stuff so um, until next time for another video, take care, God bless, and be kind, spread positivity, and be thankful, and please continue to stay safe and healthy. Please continue to wear your masks, and please continue to physical distance as much as you can from others right now to slow the spread of COVID-19. This is very much a real virus. Um, not saying that you can't go out and about and do things now, but please do them with caution. Um, because this, like I said, this virus can spread like wildfire, and we can go through, easily go through another shutdown again, or... Um, worse things can come up so please be cautious please be safe and um, I love you all and thank you so much for your support and I hope this video was enjoyable and I will see you next time bye <laughs>